we are starting a series called Sifted um, out of Luke 22. If you want to turn there, uh, I was going to share with you just a little bit more about what this was about in a moment, uh, but I'm going to do that up front really quick because I want to take just another moment to pray um, about everything that took place uh, in, in or around the city of Buffalo this weekend. I don't know much because I was busy with my kids, but as I got up this morning, even saw the news here in our own state and not, not too far from us, this tragedy of 12 or 13 people that died. And we're going to be in this series talking about what happens when things happen in our life, loss, or disappointment, or failure, and how we stay strong in our faith with God. And all I know is that there's some people today that are struggling with that. Uh, as they've waken up to pe people they love that are not there. And so could we as a church just pray for them um, this morning? Lord, we, we just lift up, Lord, all the different families and individuals who have been affected by this. Lord, I don't know really many of the details, but I know this. There's certainly people waking up this morning, God, wondering where you were or wondering what's going on or how this could happen because they're missing people that they love, friends and family. Lord, their, their life has been turned upside down. And God, in these moments, all we can do is just pray that your peace would be with them, your grace would be with them. I pray that some of them would be going to church today. I pray all of them would be, but that, that, that some would be going to church and be encouraged and that they would have people to cry on their shoulder and people to surround them and to hug them and put their arms around them and let them know that they are loved and that, they, uh, and that God loves them and that they, he, you will be with them through this entire thing. Lord, we just lift them up to you today, Lord, and we recognize God as, har as hard and difficult as that is for those families. Lord, we're, we're praying every week for things that are happening in Ukraine and the, 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 uh, the separation that families and children are experiencing. Lord, we live in a, in a broken world, Lord, where there's a lot of tragedy and God, we just, we want to have hearts that continue to be soft and compassionate and recognize uh, when people are hurting and be people that can pray and ask that you would come and touch in these situations. So do that today, God, even as we study this ourselves of how to stay connected to you and keep our faith in you in the midst of times that get really hard. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So we're going to be looking at this series called Sifted, and uh, um, it, it, it kind of is what it sounds like it is, that there are times in our life where, uh, like you would sift flour, or in this case, wheat, as we'll look at in a moment, um, that we get sifted in our lives. We get tossed and turned and, and, uh, and, and feel like we're just going through the ringer, and in those moments, how do we stay connected? How do we keep a faith that is strong in the Lord, and, and you know, a lot of ways we felt like we've gone through a, a two-year sifting process uh, in our world in the midst of this uh, pan pandemic that we've gone through, and the economy, and world wars, and man, we're being sifted. So how does this, how does this work? How do we maintain our faith in God? So we're going to look at that um, for several weeks, and we're going to start here in a passage in Luke 22. Let me just say this really quick. Jesus is almost to the point where he is going to be crucified and then resurrected, and he's sharing with his disciples, and they're in the midst of this time where Jesus is about ready to give his life terribly, excruciating pain, and right before this, they're arguing about who's the greatest, which is ironic. Uh, they're kind of thick-headed like the rest of us, missing the point entirely. Uh, Jesus is about ready to sacrifice his life, and they want to know who's, who's, who's the best, and that really has to do with not sacrificing, but probably more comfort, more who would serve them, how they would be in power and authority, unlike the power and authority that Jesus is about ready to really show what real power and authority looks like. But he, he, he specifically then starts talking to Peter and the disciples about what the enemy wants to do. And, and this is important for us just to kind of set the stage for this, because uh, just because we give our lives to Jesus or we begin to trust in him or follow him doesn't mean everything's going to go hunky-dory, easy, and things are going to be great, right? We would never say that out loud, but subconsciously, there's something in us. That's why we, we, we or you know someone that questions God, you question because you have expectations that have not been met. I, I, it, it, someone shouldn't be hurt. Someone shouldn't have gotten sick. I shouldn't have lost my job. And we inevitably ask those questions because we have certain expectations. And we may not realize it, but I think a lot of us sign kind of an internal deal with God that like, hey, when I'm following you, like, like you're going to make some things work. And so when they don't work, we have a tendency to get frustrated at God. And that is a real tactic of the enemy. He wants to get us sidetracked on those things. And so um, we, we may not articulate it, but it's there. And so Jesus is letting them know, listen, it's not that it's going to be easy now that I, I'm going to die and then be resurrected. In some ways, it's going to be harder because you're going to live in a, right now you're with me, but there's going to come a time where I'm gone and you're going to have to live in this tension that you know me, but not everything has come to its full fulfillment yet. 
And so here's, here's what he says to, to Peter, specifically in Luke 22, verse 31. Peter's name was Simon before Jesus renamed him Peter. And he goes back to this original name here. There's probably some good reasons for that, but we're going to just look at this a little differently this morning. So Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, and Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me, you will deny three times that you know me. Okay, before we jump totally into this, let's just imagine ourselves in the story, right? Let's imagine ourselves like we're someone like Peter, and we've had this time where we've gotten to spend with Jesus. I mean, that's pretty incredible. People are, hey, what'd you do this weekend? Well, I don't know. Jesus and I were hanging out all weekend, right? Like, we did some fishing, and we did some eating, and I was with Jesus. And then, and then all of a sudden, you're like, and you know, it was strange. He told me that Satan was going to come and really do something bad in my life. And we, what you would probably say is, oh, man, what did he do to Satan? Like, did he rebuke him? Get behind me, Satan. You know, did he, did he tell Satan where to go? You know, down back down there, right? Like, what did, and, and your response would be like, well, no. He said that when Satan was done, he would pray for me that I would return. <laughs> You'd be like, whoa, what would you do to Jesus? Like, like why, did, why didn't he just stop that, right? If you're, if you're like anybody, wouldn't you think if Jesus came to you and said Satan wants to you know, sift you or buffet you right now, you wouldn't say like, and you're going to stop it, right? If, if, what would your response be if Jesus said, and I'm just going to pray that after you go through it, you're going to come back? <laughs> You'd be like, well, how about the preventative prayer, Jesus? Like, how about the like, you're going to stop all attacks against me, no weapon formed against me shall prosper? You'd have a whole bunch of verses, right? I mean, come on, Jesus, are you going to do something different than that? And Jesus doesn't. He says, Peter, I'm going to pray for you that when it's through, your faith will remain that your faith would not fail, but that you will return and that you will strengthen others. I don't know at that point, I don't know if that's really encouraging. Like, yeah, and he told me after I go through all these trials, I'll have strength for other people. You know, like, you know, Jesus, I'd have better strength for them if you just let me not go through them. I'd tell them how wonderful it is, right? But that's not the way that it is. And he tells Peter, listen, I'm, I'm gonna pray for you that your faith would not fail. This is, this is not the prayer that we always wanna hear right away, but sometimes, Jesus knows that there's things that we need to go through. Let, let me explain it this way. First of all, when, when Satan says, I want to sift him or sift him like wheat, there is this two-part process of sifting wheat. We, we have to kind of get out of our own minds maybe how we sift things today. We might have little sifters, different things that we use. Well, they had a two-part process. The first was called the threshing, which sounds a little bit like the word, sounds a little harsh, and it was. Um, if, if they didn't have much money, they didn't have much equipment, they would just thresh with something that we might call like a big rake or broom, and they would just smash the wheat down as much as they can, trying to break it apart and break the wheat kernels, the seeds from, from the chaff, from the rest of it, um, that would not be used for making food or doing anything with it. And so they would beat it, or, or sometimes they, they actually could roll stones and use for some farm animals that they had more money, they had the ability to do that. But the process was threshing. You got to break it apart. And then they did the winnowing, which sometimes you've seen people do this in huge baskets. They would take it and throw it in the air, and then they would just catch it. And it was like the early form of sifting, not through a sifter, but throw it in the air. And then the air would sift it, and you would catch it in the big basket again because the chaff uh, was, was lighter. It would blow away in the wind, and the seeds would fall, and that's how they would do it. Not the, maybe the most efficient, but it worked. It worked well for them. And when you think about the enemy saying, I want to sift you, Peter... The image is not one of helping Peter, how Jesus sees the situation is there's something positive here, but the enemy is just thinking or we thinking of it, he, just wanting to thresh, just wanting to beat him and break him down, to break him and his faith down. And Jesus, instead of saying, no, you may not do that or stopping the enemy, he allows the enemy to do this sifting process because in the end, Jesus knows, hey, Peter, in the end, when you return, you're not going to lose your faith. I'm praying you're not going to lose your faith. But when you return, you're going to be stronger than when you went into it. And in that strength, you will strengthen others. Because God knows that there are some things that we all need to go through. Because if we don't, we don't get some of that stuff in our life broken off that needs to get broken off. Because on our own, we're not doing it. That's, that's just true for all of us. And so there are times where he allows us to go through some difficulties 
It's because things in our life need to get broken, need to get broken off and need to go away so that a stronger faith and a more solid foundation is left for us with God. And what's interesting is kind of the way in which Satan will oftentimes do this and test our faith. Before I explain that specifically, I want to ask you about a date, August 21st, 2017. August 21st, 2017. Does anybody remember what happened on that date? I was really impressed. Someone in first service nailed it. Anybody remember? You don't remember the date probably, but you do remember the day. August 21st, 2017 was, was called now the Great American Eclipse. Anybody remember looking at the full solar eclipse that took place? And the reason we called it the Great American Eclipse, you can show that picture, um, was the fact that you could see this eclipse. There's a picture of it, I think, out in California. Um, and uh, you could see the eclipse all the way from coast to coast in the United States. That doesn't happen very often. There's going to be a full lunar eclipse, I think, tonight, a blood moon that you can see in parts of the United States just tonight. But this eclipse, full solar eclipse, took place from coast to coast. There were certainly parts that you could see it better, but virtually anywhere in the, in the main continent of the United States, you could watch this full solar eclipse happen. And it was, it was really incredible. I'd never seen a, a full eclipse like that before. And they were talking about it for weeks. Somehow we, we missed exactly when it was going to happen because August 21st, I should have checked, but my guess is it's a Friday or Saturday because we were heading uh, down, Friday's my day off, we were heading down to, to Frederick to do some shopping and do some things with the kids and all of a sudden we're realizing because you could kind of just see the sky changing, we're like, oh my gosh, that eclipse is happening. So we, we pull off the road somewhere near Thermont, which forgive me, I'm from, originally from California, I call all this around there, the middle of nowhere, and I thought, where are we going to get you know, those goggles to watch this thing and see this thing take place. And we're driving around finally, well, you know, at the library, certainly they're wanting to teach things to people at the library. They've got to have some of those. So we pull in, none. Here, you go, the picture, right? People are wearing these things. I like this one. I wish I would have had the, the, the plate, the plate glasses. That, that's like the best way to do it. So we're sitting there in Thermont and I'm wanting the kids to see this. And so I'm thinking maybe we'll be okay. Cause they've been warning us for weeks, right? Don't look at it uh, with, without the protection. So I'm like, well, maybe we look through the tent of our sunroof and sunglasses and our fingers. Like we can kind of, and, and just even trying to glance at it, you're like, nope, that's not healthy. Uh, nope. We need to keep moving. So we eventually got to the big city of Frederick and we found um, some, some place. I don't know if it was Costco or Lowe's. We went in someplace and everybody's outside looking at this and they were passing out some glasses, extra glasses people had. And so we looked at it. And the first thing I thought was, I mean, they were amazingly dark. I felt like I put on a welder's helmet and now I'm looking, you know, at was maybe could be the sun. It was just so dark and see a little bit of light, but that's what it looked like. Just that, that little bit of that glow around there, right? Okay. So this was the great eclipse and we all know what eclipse is now for sure, for sure and what it looks like if we went through that and simply that word, what that means is when something comes in front of something else, it, it covers it up. And so the moon in this case was getting in front of the sun, even though the moon is so much smaller, it's just so much closer than the sun that it comes in and literally almost seems like it blocks the view. Now keep this in mind, this is always good news, the sun hasn't gone anywhere it's doing just fine, right? It's still blazing and shining light. It's just something's got in the way of it. And this is something that's important for us to realize because this is a tactic of how the enemy wants to discourage us and to try to get our faith to fail in our life is by eclipsing who Jesus is and what we know of him and what we've seen of him in his life. And the reason we know that is because there's actually this word is used. In verse 31, when, P when Jesus tells Peter, I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. It's a Greek word, um, a, a klepo or a klipo, um, and it has the root in it, not fail, has the root in it for eclipse, the word that we have for eclipse. And Jesus kind of revealing like, hey, I'm praying for you that what the enemy is trying to do is trying to eclipse your, your faith, your view of who Jesus is with this incident, um, this incident of failure we're going to get to in just a moment. He's wanting to, to block your view of who I am, and I'm praying that when it's all done and that gets removed, that, that your faith in me will remain strong. But in the process of that, Peter, in the process of that, it's going to break off some things, some, some areas of belief, some things that maybe you believed in me that you, 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 know, you don't need to believe or aren't really true. And so this idea that, that the enemy is in our life, he is going to constantly try to bring things in that are going to eclipse 
your view of God, the proper perspective of who Jesus is, and to discourage you and to try to get you to even give up on your faith in who Jesus is. This is the enemy's strategy, to eclipse your view of Jesus, to put something between you and him that limits your view and perspective, block the light and put you in the dark. And by the way, um, the the newest NIV version, the one I read to you, corrected this, which is good because a lot of translations for a lot of years didn't say this. But when when Jesus tells him, hey, listen, the, the enemy asked, Satan asked to sift you like wheat for a long time. Translations just said you. But the correct translation is what we read today. It says that the enemy wants to sift you all. It is a plural. He was talking to not just Peter, but to all the disciples and in that sense, all of us. That this is a tactic that the enemy has that he wants to do in each of your lives is he wants to bring something in that will block your view, your understanding of what you've thought about Jesus in order to, to try to corrupt, to try to ruin your faith. And so what do we do when we go through times like this? Well, like I said a moment ago, the key is to always remember, hey, the sun is still there. The eclipse is just for a moment. It's just something blocking your view and your perspective, but nothing's changed, and nothing's changed about God. Nothing's changed about his son, Jesus. I heard a pastor say this recently, which I thought was really good. He said in this moment, you know, where Peter's here, he's like, he believes in Jesus, but what he doesn't realize, there's a lot of things that he believes about his belief in Jesus, and those things need to go, and there's a difference between what I really know about Jesus and what I believe about my belief in him. And some of those things are built on things that just need to be broken down, need to, need to be broken up, and that's why Jesus was going to allow this to happen. So there's a lot of different ways, and we're going to look at this over the next few weeks, when disappointment comes in, when we experience loss, when, when things uh, don't, don't get healed the way we want them to, brokenness in our life, these, these things that want to eclipse God and his goodness and the truth of who he is in our life. But today we're going to look at the first one, um, not in any particular order, but this one certainly is, is oftentimes out of the gate in our life, and that is one of the things the enemy wants to do to just uh, put, a, put a barrier, put an eclipse in your life and, and try to hurt your faith is just simply your sin. People try to put your sin in between you and God to get you out of focus and off track. And there's, there's several different ways that he can do that. This is certainly not exhaustive. But one of the ways that he will attempt to ruin your faith by putting your sin in front of Jesus is try to, number one, convince you that your sin is too big for God. And I've seen this and heard this so many times. That you just, it'll prevent you from coming to God, from, from bringing that to him because, oh my goodness, God would not want me. You don't, you don't know what I've done. You, you don't realize, yeah, yeah, uh, you've heard other people and what they've done, but you don't know the thing that I've done or I've been a part of in my life. And we forget that this is the reason why Jesus came from the very beginning. But man, this lie comes in really subtly. No, you know, yeah, he, he can forgive a lot of things, but not, not that thing. And the whole thing the enemy is trying to do is trying to convince you that God's grace through Jesus, his forgiveness, his mercy, is simply just not big enough for whatever that is that he has told you about. You can't bring that to God. You can't expect God to forgive you. I've heard people say so many times, and I've had the conversation in counseling so many times where people will say, I just cannot forgive myself for this. And I always say, good news. You, you don't need to. The Bible never said you need to forgive yourself. In fact, the Bible doesn't say to forgive yourself because forgiving yourself really means nothing, right? You need to pay the penalty for whatever you've done. And you haven't paid the penalty. And you can't pay the penalty. Only Jesus could do that. And he did, right? He's the one that paid the debt. So you don't have to worry about forgiving yourself. You just need to know that Jesus forgave you. And he paid that debt, whatever it is. But boy, the enemy wants you to get all caught up and think, no, 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 it's just too big. I've done too much. There's no way. Or... Or I think a lot of times it's a little bit more subtle than that. We think, well, maybe, maybe I'll get into heaven because I know that, you know, God, he may do it, but you, you better make sure you're on your best behavior. You better make sure that you're, you're really trying hard to, to do things. It's called work salvation. You're, you're trying to, to do, I better go to that Love Gettysburg. I better go to that mission trip. I better, I better try to do all I can because I don't know in the end if, if I've, I got to get that scale tipped. Oh, my goodness. That's just totally enemy trying to eclipse the fact that God's grace, his forgiveness, his love for you is enough. It's big enough to cover whatever it is you've done. But if it's not that your sin is too big for God, he'll try to convince you that your sin is too big for you. Too big for you. This is where we feel stuck. We get stuck in addictions or in patterns, and we just think there's no way that I can get out of this. There's no way that, that I can follow through. And what happens is we, we begin to see our own failure 
and project that on God and say, there's no way that God's going to accept me. Not with how many times I've messed up. Not with not the fact that I've done this again. And we just begin to project that on, on who God is, and the enemy is duping us because we can't seem to get past it. How many times have I promised myself I wouldn't you know, do this, or I wouldn't yell at my spouse, or yell at my kids, or I wouldn't use that language, or I wouldn't lose my temper? How many times have I promised myself, you know, I'll stop looking at, for many people, porn in their life or, or different, you know, uh, sexual addictions or brokenness? Or how many times have I promised myself I would not go back and, and drink like that again? And we just think, because that problem gets so big, we think, you know, God's probably not interested anymore. There's no reason to try. And that's what it even says in 1 John, man, how do we know that we are saved? Because we love God. And we obey his commands. And then it says, and his commands are not burdensome. And, and probably a lot of us would say, I feel like his commands are really burdensome at times. Well, it's, it's not saying it in the way that we normally say it. It says this, that when you are really following God and you're loving him, he is changing your life. And all of a sudden, the things that you never thought you could do or the things in your life you never thought you could change, all of a sudden they start changing. Not because of you, but because of him inside of you. But the enemy wants to convince you, no, nope, too big, too deep, too strong. There's no way that God can change it. And once he convinces you that they're too big, they're too much of a burden, burden he's got you. Because now he's got you focused on you and not on Jesus. And he's eclipsed who Jesus really is and what he's done in your life. This happens so often when we're, uh, when we're new believers. A pastor I love, I listened to at times, was, was talking about this the other day. I thought it was good. You know, when we first get saved, he's like, you know, we see God everywhere. Right? It's just like you, you come home from work or you come home from school and you're like, man, God is so good. He was with me all day. Like I knew it. I had a busy night tonight and my teacher said, there's no homework. And I knew that was God. Like that was God, right? And then, and then I was getting ready and, and like that light turned green just when I needed it, right? And you're so excited. You're like, oh, that was Jesus. I needed that green light, right? And so you're like up every morning, you're praying, you're reading your Bible, doing the best you can, and then you, you, know, you get really tired and you miss a few days. Oh, and then you hit a red light and you're like, oh, I knew it, I knew it. God's upset at me. I didn't pray for an hour this morning, I knew it. And you start thinking that it's based upon your performance. You start thinking, and what you first thought was all God everywhere because you knew and you knew that he saved you only because of what Jesus did, quickly can turn in back to how are you doing and are, are you following through on everything? And your faith starts resting in your faithfulness instead of Jesus' faithfulness. And so then you start to see God everywhere against you. It's totally the enemy. No, nope, you're too messed up. No, nope, you tried. You gave it two weeks. Forget this whole Christian thing. You can't do it. No, that's not why we're Christians to begin with. Because I can't do one day what God has asked me to do. That's why I trust in Jesus, right? So who convinced you your sin's too big, God doesn't want you, or your sin's too big, you can't follow through with this? And none of that, none of that's the God. And this is what he's doing with Peter. It's interesting, there's a place in Zechariah where he's having all these visions, and he has this vision of Joshua, who was the high priest in that, at that time in Jerusalem. Here, just check this out really quick. This is such a great little passage, but I just thought some of you might really relate to this personally. So he says, I see Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. But Satan is standing at his right hand, so he's, he's able to see this vision. And Satan's there accusing him. And the Lord says to Satan, may the Lord rebuke you, Satan. May the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Isn't this man like a burning stick snatched from the fire? He says, stop accusing my man Joshua. He, he, he is a, a burning stick that's been snatched from the fire. He's not perfect, but he's been pulled out of that. You do not have authority to accuse him anymore. Why? Let's go to the next verse. He says to Joshua, was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood there before the angel. But the angel spoke to those standing around and said, remove his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, I have freely given you, uh, freely given, forgiven your iniquity, and I will dress you in fine, fine clothing. He didn't say, Joshua, good job. You read your Bible every day and prayed. You haven't cussed in a week. Take off those filthy clothes. You've earned it. No. No, he didn't stand there, but that's what the enemy wants to do. And he day and night accuses you. Oh, you messed up again. Oh, you couldn't do it again, so you couldn't follow through. And he convinces you that you, you live in those dirty clothes. You, you own those dirty clothes. But Jesus has come and said, yeah, you've made the clothes filthy, but I've given you a fresh set that come from me and my righteousness, 2 Corinthians 5.21. 
He who knew, Jesus knew, no sin became sin for you. He took your filthy garments so that you could wear his garments of righteousness. Yeah, you're not perfect, but that's why you're someone who says, I believe in Jesus. Because my garments were always dirty. He, he, Joshua did not have the clean garments because he did it all right. He had the clean garments because he had given his life to God. And someday that great high priest would be Jesus. I mean, there's so much that's pointing us there to him. But same in our own life. Because the enemy, what he wants to do is he wants to steal your confidence. Because once he steals your confidence, then you won't, you won't take those step of faith out for God anymore because you just see yourself as your failure and as your sin. And it's interesting, when Jesus finds Peter after, uh, after he was resurrected, where does he find him? Back in Galilee, fishing. If you remember, when Jesus first found Peter fishing, he was fishing, and I say this all the time, he wasn't doing good. He wasn't catching fish in either time. But he found him and said, listen, I'm going to come, and I, I want to come and take you and make you a fisher of men, right? And it, what did Peter do? He left his nets, his boats, everything. He left the business behind, and he followed Jesus. Jesus now is gone, and it's not just that Jesus was gone. Peter's going to deny him, right? Just later that night, this is what we just read. Jesus said, Peter, you're going to deny me. And what did he do in the midst of his failure? He just went back to what he thought he was good at, which he wasn't good at it. But he just went back to what he knew. You know what? I blew it. And there are some of you here that you just keep going back to the things that God has rescued you from because you don't think that you can earn it or you've done enough or you can't seem to figure it out. And that's just the enemy because God is big enough and he loves to come and rescue you in your places of failure. You know, have you ever been on a diet? Um, does anybody relate to that? There's a couple people here. Um, ever been on a diet? I've heard of this before. Uh, no, okay, my wife accuses me of this continually. And uh, if I'm trying not to eat sweets or something at certain parts of the year, and then it's like Thanksgiving or Christmas, right? Let's say it's Thanksgiving. I'm over at someone's house, and they're like, hey, I made this homemade pie. I want you to have it. I feel bad. You know, I don't want to tell them, no, I'm on a diet. That's rude. You know, so for the love of God, like, and to serve them, give me a slice of pie right? Because I don't want to hurt their feelings. Here's the problem, and my wife knows it. On my way home, I've already figured it out in my mind. I've already blown it. So when I get home, I'm going to finish off the ice cream, all the cookies that I haven't been eating. I mean, I will look through the whole house to find, because now it's kind of like, well, it's done. So now any other calories today just don't seem to matter in my mind. Anybody else feel that way? Here's the problem. I think that's just true for Thanksgiving. And then the next day, I'm like, you know, Christmas is just around the corner. So maybe I'll just, you know, eat candy and desserts until Christmas, and then I'll start again, right? That is the pattern in our physical lives, but that is the pattern that the enemy wants to convince you of with your sin all the time. Oh, you blew it again with porn again? Well, you might as well just go all the way. You might as well just go and do whatever you want sexually. You might as well just go ahead and throw away your relationship or your marriage. You've already screwed it up. Oh, you promised that you wouldn't drink alcohol and you did it again? You know what? You might as well just take off now and go drink as much as you'd like. Guys, I've not only seen it in my own life, I've seen it in so many people's lives. It's the way the enemy works. He convinces you in that moment of failure that your failure is too big. So just go ahead and go back to fishing because you didn't belong here to begin with. And that is the enemy every time. Oh, you thought you were something, but you really hear nothing. And it's the attack of the enemy to rob you of your confidence, to rob you of your confidence. Now, we don't have our confidence in ourselves right? Because not only does he want us to steal our confidence, but the second part of this is he wants, to st he wants to put our confidence in the wrong place. And that was the problem with Peter. He was confident in Jesus, but he was even more confident in his own confidence in Jesus. And that's what Jesus wanted to break away and get out of Peter's life, right? Let's go back to this, verse 33 and 34. Well, after Jesus says, hey, tonight you're going to deny me three times, Peter then goes and corrects Jesus. Can we do a little side sermon just really quick? No one needs to correct Jesus. Right, just really quick, right? We, we all need to hear it though at times. We're like, no, 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 God, you got it wrong. <laughs> Let me just tell you. He, I heard someone say a long time ago, God does not share information for us for our opinion of whether we want to do that or not or whether we agree. He, he shares this information because it's what's true, right? So he tells Peter, you're gonna deny me. And Peter says, Lord, I'm ready. Oh, man, don't keep talking, Peter. Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, oh, I'm sorry. Then Jesus answered him. I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times that you know me. Lord, I'm ready. Mm, not really. 
right? In another translation, it's, or not translation, another book in the Gospels, uh, it doesn't say it here in Luke, but in the others, Peter literally says, you know, Jesus, I don't know about the rest of them, <laughs> which is great. I don't know. I take them or leave them, right? He says, I, they all may fall away, but not me. Not me. No. I'm going to stick through. Can you imagine the audacity, right? He's looking at the rest of the disciples. He's like, you know, Jesus, I've been taking a look probably like you have been. Yeah, I don't see him coming through. But Jesus, me, you can count on me. And Jesus is like, oh, Simon, Simon. The problem is not that you believe in me, but the problem is you believe too much in yourself and your belief in me. And the enemy will exploit that every time. Because your faith is not built on your faithfulness, Peter. It's built on mine. And I think Peter, just like any of us, had been spending a lot of time with Jesus. And he's probably thinking it's wearing off. Like, I'm doing pretty good. Like, I'm doing really well. Right? I've gone months now without that problem or without that mistake or without that sin. And we think it's because we've done it. And slowly and subtly, our faith gets built on our faithfulness again. And Jesus said, oh, Simon, Simon. (laughs) I'm going to let Satan do it. Because when it's done, you'll no longer trust in yourself, but you'll just trust in me. Because Peter, you can't save anybody. Only I can save the world. And I've just asked you to tell the world how much I've saved you from yourself. You're not the one that you need to proclaim. Peter, it's me. But he says, Lord, I'm ready. He just didn't realize it yet. His confidence was in his confidence. His trust was in his faithfulness to trust and to act. It was a false assurance. So just really quick, if, if Satan doesn't get you with, with your sin with those first two, he'll just flip it. And he'll make your sin seem too small to need God. And he'll just make you work at it yourself. You'll just figure it out. You don't bring that to God. You, don't, you, know, you know you've got an issue. You know you can't overcome something. But you don't tell God about it. You don't tell other people about it. You just work harder. That's actually kind of the same thing but flipped upside down. Oh, you think you can handle it. And he'll convince you you can handle your sin. That somehow you can just work hard enough. It's called sin management. No one can do it. It'll exhaust you, wear you out, and leave you completely broken. So either your sin becomes too small to need God or your sin becomes too small for you to worry about it. Both of these are bad deceptions as well. Trying to get you to eclipse, but in a different way, putting you in front of Jesus so you can't see him. Maybe that's called a lunar eclipse. Not really, but we'll just pretend. Um, but he's convincing that you don't, need, you don't need him. You can do this on your own. And you probably wouldn't say that outright. You wouldn't say that you know, uh, out loud. But you're working at it like you don't need Jesus. And it's exhausting, which is why Jesus said, come to me all you are weary and heavy laden and I'll give you rest. He's talking about sin. He says, all of you who have been trying this sin management thing to figure it out yourself and do it on your own, come to me. Right? And if we're not trying to manage our sin... We also, we have to be really careful not to get to a place, and I don't have time to go into it, but where we just start to think our sin's not a big deal because we just don't think I could ever live my life without, without that relationship or without this drink or without doing this thing or without feeling that way or having anger. I just can't imagine it. So you know what? I think it'll just be okay. Like just, and we start to compromise. We start to dilute it. And we start to say it's not that big of a deal. And as if we, we decide to live in the eclipse forever, instead of realizing, no, wait a minute, it's so much greater when that sun shines directly on you. The enemy convinces you you can't do that. He'll expose you, but that's false. That's a lie. When that sun shines, it doesn't expose you. It casts out the darkness when you allow Jesus' grace and his light to come in your life. He just wants you to stay in darkness. Don't compromise, folks. This is actually a different example where it talks about straining or sifting in the Bible, Matthew 23, Jesus talking to the the Pharisees says this, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter, those things, without neglecting or practiced what he was talking about in this scenario and not neglected the former things, those things. But he says this, I want you to catch, you strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. (laughs) What What does that mean? They would spend an elaborate amount of time covering their wine especially, but any other kind of drink that would attract bugs because they believed if you drank something and and you swallowed a gnat, you'd become unclean. You have to go through this whole process. And so Jesus is talking about the the, the, uh, the paradox of their life that they're spending all this time trying not to swallow a gnat while they are completely living with hatred and, and hearts of pride and not humility to serve other people. They're, they're not loving people, and they don't care because they're worried about not drinking a gnat. 
He's like, you know, if you don't realize, the enemy will flip it around enough where you don't see your own sin. And what you end up doing is straining out what you think you're doing well and you think you're doing fine and you've missed the big sins. That's the camel, right? You, you don't even realize you haven't drank in a nap, but you've swallowed the biggest unclean animal there is. And that's what happens when we, when we, when we uh, aren't, aren't paying attention to the way the enemy can even shift that and turn it upside down on us. So here, what's the point? When Satan puts your sin between you and God, you need to reposition your faith. And I've already kind of said this, but you can do it in two main ways. You put your faith in the faithfulness of God and not your own faithfulness. He didn't save you because you had it all together. He saved you because you trusted in his son Jesus who did not sin and had it all together. So when an enemy puts the sin and gets your sin right in your face, you choose to see the beauty and faithfulness of Jesus. That's what Lamentations 3 says, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, God. Instead of waking up and, real, and trying to live your day, I'm not going to make a mistake today. I used to do that when I was a kid, when I first met Jesus. I, I had a little notepad, and I would try to go the whole day without sinning. I'd write them down when I did. The joke of that is, is even if I could have gone a day where I only wrote down one or two things, I would have missed a thousand of them because you just don't even know. You don't wake up your day saying, all right, today, God, I'm going to do it. I'm going to live for you and try hard not to make any mistakes. You wake up and go, God, thank you for your faithfulness to me today. God, cover my sin even now and help me and guard my heart and lead my heart because I can't do this without you, right? You, you reposition your faith in God's faithfulness, not in yours. And secondly, my faith is in the grace of God, not in my worthiness or my performance. We don't try to hide or excuse our sin, but let the light and the holiness of God shine into our heart and life. And I'm gonna use a verse for this, Romans 5. It says this, the law was brought in, into this world so that the trespasser, another word for sin, might increase. But where sin increases, grace increases all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The reason I read this to you is it's really interesting. The law, or this, the Bible, was given to us so that our sins might increase. You might say, ha, I knew it. That Bible's always trying to make us feel bad and feel guilty. Well, not, not in that sense. I'm not trying to make you feel shameful like you're a terrible person. The Bible was given to us, the law was given to us so that we would know right and wrong so that we, and, and, and the Bible already knows, we all have plenty of wrong in our life. So the Bible is trying to point out the wrong so that we know where to go to fix it, to find healing, and to find grace. Because if you don't know your sin, you don't know to look for grace. If you refuse your sin, you refuse grace. And nobody wants to do that because you can't do it good enough. You can't live up to it. You don't want to live your life trying to measure up. You want to live your life knowing that God has grace for that. Let me give you a really quick example before we close. There's a couple I was meeting with a few years ago. Uh, they're getting married, and they had pride themselves because of where they had come from in their life. Um, they did not live for God. Had 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 <clears throat> multiple um, uh, partners, sexual partners in their life, and now they got together and they hadn't had sex, and they were very proud of that in a good way, saying, "God, we don't want to do this. We want to honor you and do it your way. Not live together, not have sex before we get married." And they were doing great. And it was really fun to meet with them. And I met with them one day as we were doing the counseling, and I could tell something was wrong, something was off. And I was just kind of probing. I don't know. And eventually, they just kind of said, "Well, we messed up, and we had sex a couple times." And uh, I was like, okay. And then they quickly went into the story where they just completely justified the whole thing. They were like, well, we're getting married soon and we just know that, you know, God doesn't want us to live in shame and we're gonna get married and we love each other, we're committed to each other, we're not gonna do it again and da 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 And they just kind of justified this whole thing. And I just looked at them and smiled and I said, listen, it's okay, yes, God forgives you. But he can only forgive you if you ask him to forgive you. And I said, here's the choice you have to make right now in this marriage, in this relationship. Do you want to set a course of grace or do you want to set a course where you try to justify your behavior? Because inevitably, I pray you don't have an affair. Neither of them have. They're still happily married. But I said, inevitably, you will not be faithful to your spouse and to God many, many times in your walk. Are you going to justify it every time? Because if you do, you walk away from grace. But if you come before God and say, God, we blew it, we messed up, forgive us. This is not too little to just ignore. This is not too little, we'll work on ourselves. But we say, God, we sinned. I said, you received God's grace. 
Because that's what you're going to need in order to stay married. That's what you're going to need in order to stay close to God. It's not try to justify your sin or redefine sin according to what you think is right or not even pretend like you need God's forgiveness. Go get his forgiveness and watch the healing and the beauty that comes. And it was a great conversation. And they, they, they repented they, they, on their own. I said, you decide what you want to do with God. And they came back and told me, you know, we repented and we don't feel guilt and shame. We feel God's grace and his strength over us. And it was a beautiful thing. But here's the deal. We do that in our lives all the time. Where instead of just receiving the grace, we reject it out of, out of feeling the shame. Or we, then we try, to, we try to just justify it or compromise it. And we lose the fact that where sin increases, where I acknowledge my sin, grace increases all the more. And the, the irony is, is when I bring my sin to God, I'm not going to do more sin. When I taste his grace for what I've done, it empowers me to live for him in greater ways than I ever could before. So that's my challenge for all of you. You don't want to just skirt your sin under the rug. Oh, you're missing the power of grace to pull you out of the depths of any failure and any sin. You don't want to ever think it's too big that God couldn't do anything, so throw it all away. No, bring it to God and accept his grace in your life. Lastly, and this is just for really quick to say, because we'll look at this more in weeks to come, but what did he tell Peter? When you return, you'll be stronger. And when you do, I want you to give that strength to others. And what is that strength? Not how great he did. Not you should show, I want to show you all that Jesus taught me and how I can do it. What would be Peter's strength? Hey, if I could tell you, this would be him talking to somebody else. Hey, if I could tell you anything, first of all, don't tell Jesus, you'll never deny him, and you'll go and you'll live for him to death, right? <laughs> Secondly, don't tell Jesus he was wrong. Okay, okay. Thirdly, it's not about me, but it's about Jesus. I'll show you in the weeks to come. You know, Peter was crucified. I've been to the place where he was crucified in Rome. They believe it's now the obelisk that they put in the middle of St. Peter's Square. If you've ever seen the column there and don't know what that was, that's the representation of Peter's cross moved from a few hundred feet away. And when they went to crucify him, he said, you cannot crucify me right side up because I am not worthy to die like my Savior Jesus. And that wasn't a moment of shame. That was someone who realized, I've done nothing to save the world. You cannot hang me like the man who never sinned and who was perfectly faithful because I am nobody compared to him. That's someone that got it. That's someone that, that understood that forgiveness that God had for him. And it's a beautiful thing, and it's what God wants for you and I. Would you stand to your feet this morning? You may be going through a tough time in your life right now, but specifically as we've been talking this morning, I want us to be thinking about the things in our life and our sin and our failures. Close your eyes for just a moment. Maybe you've been taking that sin and the enemies convince you it's too big. You've messed up too many times and there's no way God will take you back. There's no way you should even expect him to do anything for you. It's not true. It's not true. But also, maybe you're here today and you've been slowly compromising. You've been slowly redefining that and, and, and blocking yourself off from God's grace. Either way, the enemy is trying to eclipse you. He's trying to get between you and Jesus and you fully trusting in him. Let's not allow him to do that anymore to us today. Let's not allow anything we worry about what other people think or, or anything. And let's just come before God and say, God, I am in need of your grace. I'm in need of your forgiveness. Thank you, Lord. Let's sing this song, and even as we sing it today, I'm going to challenge you to, to really respond to the Lord. But let's, let's start off by singing and opening up our hearts to him before we go this morning.